is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms. How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, here we are in hopefully the middle of summer, although I have to tell all our listeners in Colorado, it sure doesn't feel like it. It's, the good news is it's not snowing, but we do get rain, it seems, every day. But let's talk about something that maybe won't rain on your book. Here's a topic, a concept, a lot of authors maybe dream about, um, but they don't know how to execute it, to implement it, how to reach out and connect about it, and it's about movies. Is your book movie a candidate? Could it belong on the little screen? Or for some of you who have those humongous screens in your homes, a big screen. Or does it belong in a theater surrounded by other people? Or how about a documentary? I mean, there's all kinds of things that books can be converted to. With me for this hour is Philippa Burgess, and she is a background from Hollywood. She's an expert in selling literary material to Hollywood that can take all kinds of different forms. Her background includes literary management in both film and television development and production. She's got some marketing PR in her pedigree. And she is a member of the TV Academy as well as the National Association of Television and Programming Executives. So, Philippa, welcome to Author You, your guide to book publishing. Thank you. Good to be here. All right, so let's just kind of jump into it. Well, maybe why don't you give us a little bit of your background. How did you get involved in television and film and all those other goodies that come with it? Well, I think how I got started and and advice that I'd share with anyone else is you start locally. You see what is happening in your town and you get involved and you show up and you lean in and you let that start leading you. I happen to grow up in North Jersey and remember when Rob Reiner came through with a movie and I must have been kind of in eighth grade at the time, but I was certainly there kind of happily watching the production. And uh, because I was right outside of New York City, by the time I was uh, 15, I was working as a production assistant. Uh, I started in commercials and that moved to television, short films, and uh, I worked at a post-production house and basically just kept showing up and figuring out how I could help. And it wasn't long before, uh, you know, many, many conversations said, you know, you know, and reading every book uh, led me to say, hey, you know what, I should go to USC because that has the best film program and I really want to work professionally in the entertainment industry. And so I uh, studied film and international relations at USC and so I moved to Los Angeles when I was 17. And having, again, read every book, uh, their advice was, you know, go work at a Hollywood talent agency. So my first job out of college was working at ICM, which is one of the top uh, Hollywood talent agencies uh, among William Morris Endeavor and CAA. Uh, so ICM was a great place for me to really get started and really understand how the business works. And because of my educational bent where I blended international relations and film, I did so because I wasn't the filmmaker. I was definitely more of the strategist. I love understanding the economics and politics of the business and how it worked and what all of the the forces were that sort of drove decisions and how anything got done. And so I brought that lens to sort of how I started to understand the business. So it's a great lens. I love that. Is there a lens in your life for an author? All right. So with with your pedigree, now that you have, that there's a lot going on. TV has changed. Oh, incredibly. So, and, and it's some of the best writing, actually, I think they were just saying, The Sopranos um, won the Writers Guild for best writing ever. Well, it certainly was different. It, 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 it tweaked it. it. I would say that turned a lot of TV on, on top of its head. 
And and that really was a plus, I think, because yes. it 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 uh, maybe opened up the avenue. I, I think another great thing that I that uh, happened just last year was what when Netflix jumped in yes. to the circus a little bit, and all of a sudden it was um, you're watching House of Cards, yep. and, you know. And then the other thing that's come across of viewers, the big changes of viewers is they're now binge watchers. Yes, that we don't want just. An hour, actually, if you're watching TV, an hour is really 40 minutes because you have 20 to 22 minutes of commercials. <laughs> but you're, we, we know what an hour, what we do is tape it, and then we goose it through the commercials, and we pick up two, three episodes at a crack. And so DVR technology and Netflix, all mm -hmm. of that has really changed viewing habits and changed what's possible because, I mean, going back Hollywood history, the strike of 1988, uh, it was a writer's strike. It lasted for six months, and it changed the DNA of the industry and how anything got done. And at the time, television writers and feature film writers were in totally different camps. Nared, there was no cop crossover in executives or talent or writers. You were a TV writer or director or executive, or you were in feature film. And there was no cable. It was network, and it was studio feature film. And it was the, the way that it was sort of described was, the feature film was the going, there were two sisters, and feature film was just oozing and dripping with sex appeal, and was always very elevated and very classy, and everybody aspired to feature film. Uh, but she was a little bit of a spendthrift and wasn't very good with her money, mm -hmm. and um, her other sister television was much dowdier, but wealthy. And so that there wasn't the respect in television, but everybody knew that the money was in television. Mm -hmm. And so that was, uh, you know, mm -hmm. there was always sort of this jealousy kind of between the two camps, which is, did you want the sort of more pedestrian, what was considered more pedestrian television, or did you want the more elevated feature film career? And, and when you're talking about the 80s and 90s, you never, ever saw um, an executive or even a writer cross over between one industry to the other. Now the industries are completely overlaid because feature film has rolled back so much and changed so much. There is no mid-level film anymore. Well, don't, don't you see that with stars? I mean, stars start, when you said stars, you would think of the big film. Um, and in TV land, a lot of times you don't see their, their, their actors in doing things. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm mixing this up. But I always thought star stars, they stayed in their own territory. That's where they belonged. That was their niche. And then all of a sudden you saw them cross over and come in to do, uh, Glenn Close did that uh, very successfully with her series, but you come into TV land, and now they do all these voiceovers for animated uh, well, and animation, so there it is a big stew. Well, and this is the thing, so if you look at like someone's career like Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks started on Blues and Buddies on television. Exactly. But then he graduated from that and became a feature film actor. Most actors for many, many years, once you did that graduation, that was really the only crossover we ever saw was an actor who had kind of started in television, moved film. So now, that was their aspiration, to leave TV and yes. go to the big screen. And they could mm. do it. Writers really could not, and uh, executives could not. And so, but that's where we've seen such a huge change, and it's an exciting change. So as much as feature film has, what the middle is, has really gone away in feature film. You really have super high-end, $100 million movies, and you've got the, I'll call it under $20 million movies. There's not a lot of stuff. Is that, that a cheap film now, under $20 million? Uh, there's so many different levels now. Uh, I mean, because, it, I mean, I can even get it, and we'll get into this more, because I will, I will kind of put some boxes together That's for great. authors to think about. Uh, for studio movie, yes. A, so what happened is there was, and even those have sort of trended and phased out, because there was a point where all the studios were really getting jealous that Harvey Weinstein was winning, you know, who originally had founded Miramax and then... Oh, yeah, independence. The he was YC's. huge in the independent films. Yes, and so he would sort of sweep the Oscars and the studios were like, wait, we want those awards. So there was a moment in time from, I want to say, 2006 to 2010 that all the studios set up their own studio independent divisions. So you had Paramount Vantage and uh, just these little, you know, that were designed to say, we want to make these kind of cool independent movies with stars. And... and and bringing it back to this conversation, very typically based on books. Mm -hmm. They wanted, again, that, that elevated, uh, bring us the source material. And so a lot of that stuff was very book-driven, literary-driven. And, uh, and there, so there was a phase where there was a lot of those kind of movies come out. I think like Winter's Bone kind of comes to mind that were developed internally through the studio system. 
uh, less focused on that because a lot of times those things are also financed when they call it independent because they're financed outside of the studio system and then acquired for distribution by the studio system. In these cases, they were actually being funded and produced by the studio system and then also distributed through it. And that was, like I said, a trend that happened and then that ended because those big, again, Hollywood studios were like, we really don't know how to market these movies. We really don't know. This isn't sort of really where our wheelhouse needs to be. We really do need to be making the Iron Man 3s of the world and adapting DC Comics and Spider-Man. And so that is really the mindset of a major studio these days is because if you do the math, let's just take, I, I, conservatively I'll, I'll say $5, I mean if you want you could say 10 but if you self-publish a book and let's say you spend $10,000 on all of your printing and your editing and, every, and your design and everything to get that book, now you're $10,000 in, you have to sell a thousand copies at ten dollars each to break even. Yes. Yes. Okay. So now we've got a hundred million dollar movie, which is usually the production budget, the negative cost, and they've got a hundred million dollars going to prints, advertising. I mean, they're trying to take all the, the theaters digital now because they spend so much money in a physical print that they then have to also ship to a theater. And there's, that only has like a limited life and how many times that can play before they need to get a new print. And so that's a, that is another $100 million. So basically it matches. So you whatever. know, I'll tell you a question. When you talk, you talk about moving movie, and we're going we're to come up for the break here real quick. But movie tickets can range, if you go to the low-cost guy for a couple of bucks, to the first run, which you can spend, if it's 3D, 13 14 14 bucks, to, say, average $10.00. What does a studio actually get of those monies? Well, I, don't, I have no idea. Well, this is why opening weekend is so big, is because it's actually a, a scale, a sliding scale. So opening weekend, the studio gets all the majority of that money. They pay the sort of the exhibitor a nut, and then they get the, the majority of that. Every day thereafter, they get less, the exhibitor ah, gets more. So it's, it's the $100 million opener the studio's going to think, okay, we're out, we're covered, now we can go into our little sharing. All right, we're going to have a lot more. We're talking movies, your book. My guest is Philip Burgess. I'll be right back. This is Julie Stratus. is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. Is there a book in you or another author you will show you how to create, develop, and publish your book without being good? If you already have a book out, You'll find a supportive and brainstorming community that's connected and creative no matter where you live. Author U brings in national experts for its book camps and annual author extravaganza held each May. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author U's extensive network, members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publish. The Resource, its online book publishing news magazine, is content-heavy and it's free. If you want to create a book that has possessed punch and panache author you is for you if you're a hobbyist or a casual author it's not join author you today through its website at author follow author you on twitter at author you and on facebook at author you where timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted daily author you where the author goes to become seriously successful tells a story. And it's a truism that people do judge a book by its cover. Nick Selinger and NZ Graphics have been in the business of producing superior graphic cover design and interior layout for self-published authors, independent and traditional publishers for years. He has developed a reputation for 
excellent work, fast turnarounds, and best of all, affordable pricing. NZ Graphics also produces ebooks and book marketing materials such as posters, sell sheets, postcards, bookmarks, business cards, logos, and more. Books designed for his clients have won multiple book awards, including Best Book Award by U.S. Book News, multiple Evy Awards from the Colorado Independent Publishers Association, Indie Book Awards, the San Francisco Book Festival Award, and Freedom Medal Award from Valley Forge. Visit www.nzgraphics.com or call 303-985-4174 for more details about making your book the success it should be. Mention that you are an FOJ, friend of Judith's, and that you heard about NZ Graphics on your guide to book publishing. to book publishing everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask if you want to write and publish a book if you want to be successful as an author your guide to book publishing everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask is for you stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics scenarios and strategies on what to do now to get you published so let's get back to the show and here again is your host dr judith briles we're back once again and here we have and um, I will look at some, uh, actually, the way I even go to the movies, because what Felta has um, enlightened me, that if you have some of these big blockbusters, like $200 million films, that they technically need to have like 40 million people to see it, to come in and start creating the revenues that's going to come in and, and get into the payback. But of course, we all know about Hollywood accounting. Yes, and so what I want to add to that is that the numbers that you see or that they speak of, it's really important to interpret them. So when they say the budget of a movie, they're referring to the negative cost. What did it cost to get the film in the can, shot, edited, and that's it. And then typically it's referred to sort of as doubling the budget to account for what they're going to spend in marketing and advertising. Uh, so or what they refer to as P&A costs for prints and advertising. They really want to move the, the theaters dig, all digital because that will dramatically reduce their costs as far as uh, right now they spend an enormous amount of money on each print and shipping each of those prints. So if you have your $100 million Iron Man 3, that's going to cost $200 million in its marketing and advertising. I mean, it's an additional $100 million in its marketing and advertising. Now, obviously, the more successful the film is, the, more, the longer that they're going to... Uh, keep that advertising out there so they're still paying for that so those costs mm-hmm. can also increase and what we were talking about before, about opening weekend being sort of the, the marker for all of the industry is because opening weekend is, is the money that the studio will, will get back first after that it's a sliding scale with the with the exhibitor and at the end of two weeks sometimes a small house that only has one th- one screen or uh, is limited in what they they're already committed to the next film that's going to come in but for an exhibitor who has multiple screens, how long they keep a film after the initial two-week commitment is entirely up to them. And they do it based on sort of how much revenue it's, it's generating for them. And they're going to keep the majority of that revenue that comes in after that two week, that initial two-week window. Okay, so let's jump. Yes, let's leap. And um, let's, and let's for all our authors, that's, they've got a book. Um, I hear, I, there is not a day that goes by, Philippa, that I don't hear from my author, this is ideal for me. Yep. This is ideal for a TV series. Oh, this would be fabulous on Nickelodeon. I mean, I hear all those variations. And there are times that I really think, by God, this is a movie. I mean, we have, uh, I'm sitting on two books that are in uh, my offices right now. One is the um, which you know about, uh, the bootlegger 40 Ford, mm-hmm. um, and, and the star is the car. But it's not a talking car, but it's a feisty car. This car has amazing adventures. And it's a true story, except for the parts the author made up, which yes. I love it when he says that. Um, and the other one is this, there's a lot of interest in the wars, World War II, and then this book called Shotbound by Steve Snyder, which really uh, follows the, with the live journals 
from his father, who was a captain of a B-17 and shot down and describing the flames engulfing his throat and his scarf burning up as they went down and things like that. And it turns out one of the, he, when he was um, um, hiding from the Germans, that that he wrote on anything he could get his hands on, whether it was a paper napkin or, you know, anything. And one of the one of the farmers' wives found them and got all these things years, years, years later to Steve, which is awesome when you have real live accounting going on. With that said, what does an author? What, what, I, I think what we need is a reality check. What's real and not real today? What what kind of things is are the screens looking for? And then where do they go about and find them? Well, I'm gonna just like there's a couple matrices I want to run us through. So there's two things: there's push marketing versus pull marketing. Uh, pull marketing is if you are just doing your part to promote your book, find your readers, find your fans, find your communities, and get those again that PR, those those accolades, those great reviews, they're just getting your book into, I mean, I was looking at Wikipedia the other day and it, it, of, of books that have sold over you know, 50 million copies and then books that have sold over 20 and over 10. And if you're, whether fiction or nonfiction, you've got a 50-50 chance of seeing that come into a movie if you've sold over 10 million copies. If it's on fiction, it's about 80%. So there, that's, you know, that's the, the pull marketing, not saying you need to in any way reach those kind of numbers. But there's a part of it is just you doing your job as an author to continue to promote and market your book and go ahead and make it a successful book, uh, as a, as opposed to looking at it from the idea of like, oh well, if if Hollywood makes it, I'll sell more books. I mean that that that's a possibility, but that's kind of uh, a, that's what we'll call the push marketing, where you're now saying, hey, I really want to bring my story into Hollywood, and there's ways that you can do. There's a, and what's really wonderful, just like publishing has changed dramatically over the last 15 years, 10 years, five years, three years, um, so has the film and television industries and the internet has created multiple uh, points of access and a lot of resources have shown up that are in the pay to play model. And so it's not just having to look for the lucky connection or the, the somebody who knows somebody kind of, you know, there actually are real strategies and real ways that you can go in and if you think your, your book has some potential, Go get coverage on it, and those readers who work for the studios will uh, come back to you and say, "Hey, here's your story. Here's your synopsis. Here's where we feel there is or is not a movie in this." Um, and your options from there are either you, you know, if they say, "Hey, we see the movie. That's great." There's many path. There's a few paths you can kind of, kind of go down. Whether you're interested in uh, bringing that to film or to television, and uh, you know, alternatively, you can look to sort of find the movie in your book, and that's where I recommend people writing that treatment, writing uh, a three, a, it can be anywhere from three to 20 pages, it really depends on how you want to do it, and whether you want to do the traditional three act structure, or break that down into sort of the eight beats, where you have two in the first act, four in the second act, and two in the final act, uh, to just tell the story as a movie. Because okay, so you covered a lot of stuff, yes, <laughs> just actually in the last couple minutes, so let's back up just a little bit. So in push marketing, which we can identify with the indie publishing arena, that's really where we're going out and, and um, um, beating our own drums and doing that. And you're, you're... Well, in Hollywood. The push marketing is pushing it into Hollywood. Like I get that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But so we're, we're pushing it into Hollywood to letting them know, hey, dudes and we're dudettes, here. We're here. here I am. Yes. <laughs> here I am. All right. So and you talked about getting coverage. And, and that, so I, I know our listeners, most of them have clueless, what does that mean? So let's talk about the coverage and, and what is it, um, define it, and how do you go about putting that together and seeking out individuals who maybe can help you uh, either create that um, mm -hmm. and, and reach out to people, or how do you do it yourself? Absolutely. So I'm writing the book. I, this is uh, my involvement in author use, so that is coming out soon. Uh, and I'm more than happy to obviously. Uh, consult with people on this stuff, but let us start with coverage. Coverage is a long time shorthand within the industry that agents, producers, studio executives always use. It was an inside the business tool uh, because everybody running very short on time between meetings and phone calls and all the other busyness that uh, is typical in the Hollywood life would uh, not have time to sort of sit down and read a script in the middle of their day. They'd want to read the coverage and that was uh, generated by a story department that looked at the script and those people spent 
the time, synop giving it a synopsis, doing a character breakdown, identifying the genre, the page count, and giving uh, both a two to three page summary of the story and what happens beginning, middle, end, and then also there would be a comment section which could, you know, say, hey, you know, here's where it, what its strengths are, how it could be improved. And every script that's submitted obviously has a purpose. So whether it's an open writing assignment, you're giving it to an agent saying, we well, really actually want to bring another writer on, or it's for casting, or it's looking for a director, or it's a query and it's uh, looking for a representation. And so those that comment section would kind of fold in what the purpose was. And oftentimes there was a little checkbox at the end saying, you know, did it hit its marks uh, for pacing and structure and character development? And, uh, and then at the very end it would say screenplay, pass, consider, recommend, and uh, writer, pass, consider, recommend. And that was the shorthand. And at the advent of the internet, when everything started getting really popular going online, in 2000, that's when um, some guys came up with the bright idea of, hey, what if we were to offer this service to writers? What if we writers could actually see how the industry is reading their script and get that credit, see what that summary comes back to? So this is a pay, a pay group that they can go about and actually get someone to do that crunching. Yep. And they put it together so it, it's like part of a mini portfolio. <laughs> That's, it's the yeah. fastest way. If, if you're wondering, well, how do, where do I start? How do I write my treatment? And where do I start? And that seems really overwhelming. I mean, I know the guys at Coverage Inc., they, I, I know for a screenplay, uh, they charge $129. I'm not sure exactly how much they charge for a manuscript. I think their going rate is about $45 an hour. Uh, but worth every every penny because if you're looking for a synopsis, they'll give it to you, and then you can shape it from there. But they're also they assign their so they actually look at the full book. Oh yeah, and and you're telling me for forty five bucks an hour or, or an hour, but they do this all within three hours. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. It's very because they're used to reading this stuff. You know what? We're coming right out of here. We're going to be back with this. This is Judith Friles. It was to offer you your guide to book publishing. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. Since 1987, Color House Graphics has set the standard for quality book production. Whether you decide to print a small quantity of books or need a large print run, depend on Color House to help you. You'll receive professional help and advice the moment you reach one of our representatives. If you mention hearing about us on your guide to book publishing, Judith Bryles, we will provide you with discount on the first order you place. To speak with a project manager, call us toll-free at 800-454-1916 or visit us at www.colorhousegraphics.com. Ned Thompson and Harry Shore started Thompson Shore in 1972. They believed employees with great character would make up the best company. They were right. They hired people who were not only experts in bookmaking, but who were obsessed with quality and delivering exceptional customer service. Almost 40 years later, Thompson Shore remains a 100% employee-owned company. Ned and Harry knew that successful customer projects are a direct result of empowered employees. We specialize in all books for large and small publishers. Creating beautiful and well-made books, we're dedicated to pleasing our customers by making the experience a good one from start to finish. The personal touch we have with our customers allows us to be innovative in solving their most difficult challenges. Our platform also ensures that we can remain flexible to meet our customers' unique needs and expectations. Our marketing kit can create buzz for your title, enhancing the promotion of your book during infancy. When you need to test the market to gauge your future sales, we can provide digitally printed books that will transition seamlessly into a larger offset run. From ebook to hard copy to delivery, our skillful customer service teams are at the ready to answer your most pressing questions. At Thompson Shore, we know that making the highest quality books requires more than just best technologies. It requires superior customer service, professionalism to the trade, and commitment to environmental and social values. With these standards of excellence in place, you can be sure that we will always help you put your best book forward. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing.
Publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Alrighty, so we're talking screenplays, whether for film or TV, because you have to start, well, script writing and all of those things, but this is screen treatments and the like. And what Philippa Burgess, who is with me today, was talking about when I asked, explain coverage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and she started talking, she said it basically it's a shorthand tool that is used with studios and, and the like to really get into what a quick synopsis is and abstract, whether this is a yay or nay mm-hmm. and all those things. And there are people who actually do this. Yep. So there, there are a lot of living. Yep. Some of them are full time and some of them are, um, many of them are freelance um, or have the time to pick up sort of freelance work. So they now work for these kind of uh, pay to play coverage services. So the people who are reading your scripts are working at studios and networks and so they're, they're really up on what else is coming through and what level you're competing with and it's and so one of the things I want to kind of you know one of the things I think about approaching uh, anything with the entertainment industry is you know, start with a beginner's mind start with a student's mind and ask versus pitch ask questions in terms of where would this fit what are they looking for how would I structure this how would I uh, transition this idea into a movie or if this isn't seeming like it has uh, what it will take uh, for a movie everything from the visual elements to one of the things you want to consider in film, the character changes. In television, the characters never change. And that's a huge story mm-hmm. uh, when you're kind of looking at your story, like, would it go? And when I say film, also expanding our definitions, there's theatrical and then there's long form television. So the two hour movie, whether it's going to be theatrical or a cable movie, is, is still has that two hour, that arc of the character over those two hours. Mm-hmm. So, so when you work with these people, I mean, if you engage someone, I know you do the consulting, but also um, the coverage, and you mentioned Coverage Inc. Yes. And that's I-N-K, by the way, for yes. everyone. Coverage Inc. Dot com, and the email is info at Coverage Inc. Dot com. Um, that, that you have to think about, do they come back, and here's my question, do they come back and say, you know, this is really more suited, we like this. Maybe it's one they're going to recommend, and as Felpa said, they don't recommend a lot. You know, because this is what I, you know, we see with a lot of books, people think that, oh, yeah, it's the best movie ever, and it's not. But, but with that, um, that do they say in that, you know, they like it, they recommend it, they have to open up some contacts. They will open up doors for you. Oh, yes. And introduce. And will they also make recommendations is, you know, this probably is better suited for television um, versus film. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There, and, and that's and that's one of the things we want to just really, again, quickly look at if you want to do a, just a quick evaluation like on your, yourself. And actually, I want to say one clarification is speaking to authors. You are an author. You are a book writer. Coming into Hollywood, you get to stay an author and a book writer. You do not have to tackle screenwriting as the art of creating and delivering mm-hmm. a screenplay. And that's an art. Yes. It is an art. Yeah. Now, yeah. so I do mention sometimes writing that treatment just because you can't, always just hand somebody the book and have them say, oh, I get it. I see that, you know, sometimes you need mm-hmm. to pull it out for them and say, hey, you know, this is my book, but here's how I'm seeing a movie. And, right. and, and understanding and making sure it's clear with me. The thing about, just like there's shelves in, in publishing, there's boxes in Hollywood, and everything is incredibly formulaic. The secret of what everybody's looking for is they're looking for the fresh in the familiar. So yes, you want to have a, a certain spark of originality, but familiar. You need to be in a box that everybody knows and understands. So the very first thing you're going to look and evaluate your movie is how, what kind of budget are, are you looking at? Is, is it something that could be done for $5 million or is it something that has to be done for $80 million? And if you have multiple sets international, you're going to close down airports, freeways, and stadiums, you're a higher budget movie. Uh, if you are shot in this one local town, um, not as many, you know, not you're not shutting down freeways, and you don't have big action scenes, and it's a little bit more of a personal story. Then you could see that as being uh, done for a lower budget. The only thing that might knock something up from a five million dollars to a thirty million dollar budget is if you get an A-list actor to come in and play the role. So now Brad Pitt wants to do your movie; it's a thirty million dollar movie. Uh, but other than that, kind of just taking a quick look at it and saying, you know, could this be done for a price? 
that's going to tell you where it goes. Because if it has to be done for over $50 million or even over 30, uh, you're talking studio, feature film studio. If it can be done for under five, the whole market opens up to you because there you have a whole uh, the realm of sort of both independent and cable, and there's a lot of buyers who buy in that space and who look for big ideas that can be done on a contained budget. So the question is: Is your is your book a big idea, and can it be contained? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there's, that's the magic question. But let's let's talk about um, let's say it's a big idea. Yep. It can be contained. So how do we go about, what are the reasons why people buy? Why are the, re what are the reasons why TV and film might do the happy dance to your door? Well, I have that answer, but I'm going to insert one thing okay. before I answer right. that real quick. So one thing is that on the way to buying, it needs to, you, you need book genres or book genres, film genres or film genres. So you've got to, if you're looking at film, we're talking two hour, you've got to, on the light side, is it, it has to fit in one of these boxes. Is it an action comedy? A broad comedy, a romantic comedy, or a dramedy. On the dark side, is it an action movie, a thriller, a horror, or a drama? And in this context of film, each of those elicits one single consistent emotion throughout the film. So if it's a drama, it better make you cry. If it's a dramedy, it better make you laugh and cry. If it's broad comedy, it should be side-splitting. If it's a romantic comedy, it should tug at your heartstrings and be sweet and funny. If it's action comedy, it should have adrenaline and humor. If it's action, all adrenaline. Thriller, make it smart, clever, keep us on the edge of their seats, thinking, and, and bring in a little bit of that fear. Horror, all fear. And so you need to sort of make sure that if you want to bring something into the, the film world, that you are working with genre. And television is a little different. They're okay with it's a comedy, it's a drama, and their definitions of that are a little... A little softer. Different, yeah. A little softer. Uh, so with drama for television, it can either be procedural, like a law and order, or it can be, let's say, more episodic, like a Lost. And DVR technology changed storytelling because, like, when Lost came in, that was new, that mirrored the newness of DVR because it was up, it was serialized. So you had to know what, and, and same thing with House of Cards. You had to sort of know what the previous episodes were about in order to sort of catch up mm -hmm. to... You couldn't just kind of show up, and that's why a lot of times I do recap. Like I'm, I'm, uh, I'll confess, I'm hooked on 24. Mm -hmm. I am so into the new 24, but I was actually hooked when it started years and years ago. I can't remember mm. the year it started, but oh, yeah. but I would not answer the phone. I would not. That was before we could tape everything. I would not do anything yes. because this was my time. Yep. So. And we also want to talk about, with, when you're talking about television, if you're thinking episodic for a minute, and there's a wonderful market to bring stories, especially if each of your chapters can kind of jump off the page as an episode for mm -hmm. a uh, TV show, is you really want to think of, again, this mass market. CBS has, is, airs a show, and they do a lot of things that are based on books. It has to appeal to six to eight million people, and I think that is success for them. Whereas if you're on AMC... A million people's success. Um, a two million is, is gigantic. And so when CBS wanted to compete with AMC because AMC had the great success of Mad Men and they decided to like, we'll do Pan Am, Pan Am failed on CBS because good show, million viewers, but that is an epic failure for CBS. Exactly. And then, of course, one of the, the big hits of this past season um, that put NBC on top for the first time in a gazillion years was um, James Spader with Blacklisted, yeah. which is another one of my hooks. <laughs> and another one of my friends from USC who writes that show. There you go. Yeah. So so, so um, you just never know. Yep. You know, the right actor, the right story, the and, and it's, it's, it's certainly serialized. I yes. mean, you don't know what in the heck he's going to get into next. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a... And so then your real question of three reasons buyers buy... Yes. You know, so I want to say, once you know what your budget is, once you know, you know, what your genre box is, then you can kind of look at the reasons that things move, the reasons why anyone will write you a check in Hollywood or for development and or even sort of move things to green light is because it's one of these three. It's either competitive, meaning that if they don't take it off the table, somebody else will. And it also validates that it's good because all material uh, are, is subjective. And 
But if you're an executive and you need to protect your job and say, why did we buy this and how do you release funds, you need to move it to being objective. So these, so the ability to say it's competitive, it validates that it's good, and it also moves people to action because, again, there's that fear of loss and there's that competition we won. Uh, we beat out other people. That particularly works well in the studio system. Now, there's an infrastructure that was created to support that called the spec script market. Most people know now that most people things don't sell off the spec script market. But the and so what is it you're saying? Spec spec. So scripts written on speculation. Oh, spec script yes. market. Okay. The spec script market. Okay. And books can sell off of it. Go out through this, but the infrastructure still exists. So you can get anybody. And agents use this all the time to get people to read things very quickly, given this idea of like we need an answer right now. And even though now things don't buy, uh, get sold through that process, it's a great way to get exposure and get read very quickly. So your name gets out there. Yes. And for those of you who haven't seen a script, we're going to come up to a break here pretty quickly. But that it, that I think scripts are a, number one. I think they're good for every writer an author to get their hands on. Just go you, just Google free movies. Uh, scripts and download them and print them out and read them because you're going to see that these scripts are short. They're rarely ever have I seen one over 120 pages. And we're talking double and triple space and we're talking fat margins and we're talking uh, little words. And if you want to use a description that less is more, a good movie script is a perfect uh, definition of that. Yes, and also what I also recommend is we're gonna, there's two, two things I want you to think about. Think about your current book and does that translate and think about your next book because there's so many ways that you can actually fold in screenwriting technique, making sure the beats and the pacing is there. Okay, we're going to be right back. A lot more questions for Philippa, but there's lots of books. We'll make great movies for TV and film. We'll be right back. Is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. The book shepherding concept is simple. The publishing world is changing and so must you. You need an experienced shepherd and a guide to partner with you as you create, strategize, develop, publish, and achieve your publishing goals. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so, or you can create a book that looks and feels classy, builds your brand, and is a financial success, a bestseller. It's your choice. You choose. You need the book shepherd. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You don't need problems. You want solutions. Dr. Judith Bryles will shepherd you through the maze and the chaos. At times, she's had to step in and rescue a book, a book that has been sabotaged by a publisher or by a publishing service provider or sometimes even the author themselves. Judith Bryles is the book shepherd. If you want to create a book with no regrets, give her a call today, 303-885-2207. That's 303-885-2207 or email her at judith at bryles.com. By the way, Bryles is spelled B-R-I-L-E-S. Follow Judith on Twitter at My Book Shepherd and on Facebook at The Book Shepherd. At Total Printing Systems, customer service is our priority. We are located in Southern Illinois. Our employees have an average of 18 years' experience and know that customer relationships are important to our continued success. We have been a short-run book printer for nearly 40 years and always stay at the forefront of technology. Our niche is from 1 to 5,000 copies. Today, we offer digital black and white and four-color high-speed inkjet printing, a cost-effective way to introduce color into your short-run titles. We, of course, offer traditional offset printing as well. Bindery is done in-house, from adhesive case binding to PUR, perfect binding to mechanical binding of all types including side sewing we provide warehousing kitting distribution inventory management a new print on demand facility streaming browser based ebooks and bookstore 
Call us at 1-800-465-5200 for a quote on your next book project. You can also visit our website at www.tps1.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, with me is Philippa Burgess, and you can find out more about Philippa by just going to her website. And so it's Philippa Burgess, and that's double P, P H I L I P P A U R G E S S. So with that, uh, we wanted to do a wrap up on how they buy really mm-hmm. quickly. And then, Philippa, I think what we need to do is also address okay, great idea. How do I pitch it? Yes. So let's hit that one too. All right. Excellent. Okay. So uh, three reasons the buyers buy. They're going to buy because it's competitive. The second one is because there's an element or attachment that's involved. And so if you look at a movie like My Big Fat Greek Wedding, the attachment there was Rita Wilson and Tom Hanks were championing that story, and mm-hmm. Golden Circle and Financed It wanted to be in business with them. Uh, you see that all the time with um, another another movie actually that hits all three of these marks uh, was Finding Forrester. And because a lot of times I'll say for st- studio feature film, drama is the hardest to sell. This was a drama. It won the Nichols comp- uh, competition, was picked up by CAA, sent out competitively. And then uh, when Sony read it, they were just like, it's perfect for Sean Connery. And so that's Sean Connery's interest in it. That's the attachment. That was the attachment. Mm-hmm. Uh, you also obviously get the element I talked about could be the, the, the book. Mm-hmm. It's based on a book, especially if that's a best-selling book. And, and best-selling, there's multiple definitions of that. So it can be you've gotten yourself, uh, I've had clients who've gotten onto the LA Times bestseller list. You know, mm-hmm. So it you know, depends on, it could be a, an Ippy Award winner. It depends on, you know, you can find all sorts of ways to sort of spin right. your cre- credibility to make that right. uh, attractive. Mm-hmm. And then the third one is the corporate mandate. Corporate so mandate. Let's hit that. And corporate mandate, and, and this actually also fits with the Finding Forrester, was when that script night came through, he had a brand new production deal with Sony, and they said, we really need to buy a project for Fountain Bridge, Sean Connery's company, this would be a great project to sort of get him welcome to the lot and get him working on that. Right. So that sort of fit that. Corporate mandate is also very much seen in cable channels. And you will, I recommend that you go to their websites. Um, if you're looking for the ones that do original content, uh, you can look at Lifetime, Hallmark, uh, AMC, even Netflix, and you know, Amazon Studios, uh, um, TNT. I mean, figure out kind of what you guys watch and what you are interested in, kind of who's doing movies that appeal to you, and go to their website and see what kind of programming they're excited about and see how you feel of your story might fit next to that as as counter-programming. Look at their demographics. Look at their audience. Uh, And they're very corporate mandate-driven because Lifetime is competitive with Oxygen and WeTV, and they don't necessarily want, or, or Disney Channel, they don't really want to do a script that they feel the other channels would do. They want things that are going to be signature to them. Uh, but if they, it's, it's the executive who is just doing exactly what their boss kind of suggested that they, they, they find. It's very plug and play. So, so they're competitive, and they're a little bit alike, but they want to do it with a twist. Yes. Whatever the twist is. Yes. Whatever the twist is. Okay. So let's say, and, and I guess I, I think it's important to say for our listeners, if you are a writer that does, like, maybe you have a book that has a string of vignettes or something yes. into it. There could be one in there that's almost like a little novella that could pop out and just go with. It's not, and you in longer books, sometimes there's just a section within the book that becomes the possibility for, for film, not the whole enchilada. So you need to think that way. Don't, you yes. know, and step away at times. That's what I want to say. Step away, be flexible here when you move into this. Absolutely. And also manage your expectations. So we had sold a book to CBS, and that's, again, one. It's, it may sound very fancy to say that, but the reality is, you know, they spent $2 million on bringing it to pilot. The author got paid well uh, because they executed. The, it went moved from option to technically sale, but um, it didn't get past pilot because it's so incredibly competitive. Uh, you know, some things will pick up beyond pilot, but it will last two weeks. So when you go to network, mm-hmm. whereas on your cable channel, they're not going to put anything into production that they're not going to air. 
um, they want every dollar is precious to them. Whereas uh, networks will throw a lot more money at stuff and see what works, see what doesn't, and are just brutal well, in that's terms of... The, that's why you see the TNT and the MCs and all those, that if they get one million viewers, they're doing a happy dance. Yes. And doing it. They don't need that 10 million mark. They don't need that, you know, those higher numbers. And I, I told Felfo uh, when we were doing the break that with the success of Blacklist, he will bet, I will bet my life. I will see clones popping up because as soon as those some of those writers and the word merchants see something, they will go out to parallel and parrot it and pitch it, and someone's going to pick it up because someone's going to mandate corporate. We need something like blacklist. Yep, and that's what happens. All right, pitch. How do we pitch things? Well, I think that the the one way I recommend pitching is start by pitching in genre. Let me know what box it is. And and when we talk about pitching, there's again when I say approach this like school, there are some really fantastic uh, courses and feeds and opportunities that you can just access from your own home. Uh, but if you wanted to really lean in, there's great events like the Great American Pitch Fest and others that happen throughout the year, which really are practice pitching. You get to sit for five minutes and say, here's what I got. And it's, uh, again, I think of those as an out, you know, you are pitching, but it's really an ask. It's really an inquiry. Uh, if you decide, hey, I do want to sit down with some of these executives who have relations for producers who have these relationships with these channels that I want to sell to, I would like to sit down with them. That's, again, back to the pay-to-play so, model. So who are you pitching to? If, if I, let's say I go to the Great American Pitch Fest, yep. who do I pitch to? Well, in the beginning, years ago, um, the higher-end producers and agents would actually come out to these things because they were so novel and interesting that people were like, oh, this is kind of, this kind of a game. New. I, I'll check it out. Um, but at, 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 as it's, it locked some luster, now they sort of send their assistants. And, uh, and, but I think that those people, if they're paying attention, have a really good uh, idea of what works and why and what would work for their company and what their company is looking for. And so if you aren't just kind of there to sort of seek a yes or a no, but you're really there to say, well, why? Why would that work? Why would that not work? What What is, you know, really, what are you looking for? What mm -hmm. is exciting for you? Um, those people are, are well-schooled at giving. So I think of it more as just a, a mini mentorship. And, and what's the cost? I I don't know exactly, but I would say they range. Three ninety five comes to mind, but I think they can be a lot less. And, and so it's a few hundred, a, few a hundred dollars more. possibility. Yes. All right. So I think what you need to do that think about this. Don't think of it as a lark. Um, this is part of your investment. Yeah. Um, that you go on to, and so those of you who really do feel that their your work has merit in the field, you could truly see it on the big screen. And if it was somebody else's work, you would be willing to pay to go see it. That's, that's a good question to ask. Um, so you're stepped out of it. That that might be something you might want to consider, just to go get the feel of what it's like. But this is where you it, you know you have to have your ideas so succinct, so clear. Um, you don't they they don't care about your life history. This is not where you go. They do care that you have a book because I yes. can tell you so many writers who came to pitch to me. My first piece of advice to them was, well, if you wrote it as a book you'd have a lot more power and a lot more play and a lot more attention than just having it as an idea. Mm -hmm. And so having a book already establishes you in their mind's eye as a professional who has gotten something done and vetted through another industry. And so now that you're sort of saying, hey, I'd like to see how you know this translates and I can bring it here, you have a lot more power and a lot more credibility. And so having it as a book, you're already a step ahead from the advice that I, when I sat on the other side of those tables, because I always felt like that was mentorship when I when I would go to those things, being like, mm -hmm. okay, how can I help these people? But the thing that you're maybe not thinking about when you think about going to these things is the new best friends you're going to make, because you come up it really being in any way uh, you're going to. One of the things I, I was uh, just talking to another author about this the other day, I said, you want to make friends. You want to have five people in your circle, whether they're mentors that you've hired for a consult, or you've taken a class with them, or you've met them through. Any say you want to have five people that you can just pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I have an opportunity. Someone wants to sign me. Someone wants to option me. Because those opportunities, when they show up, they're gone in a minute. I mean, they're like fresh fruit. That you know that that uh, the apricot that's fresh for just you know. A, and and if you don't act and you don't know how to sort of say that's a good opportunity or not, that's not a good opportunity. And so having five people you can call and say, hey, what do I do about this? And where are you going to meet those people? You're going to meet those people by having gone to these events and these conferences over the years. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and 
you know, my, my whole philosophy on the fresh fruit, if you don't pick it when it's ripe, it rots. So, yeah, you really have to move on it. Yes. Uh, whatever it is. Yeah, so Whatever having people in your corner who you can you can reach out to and say, hey, is this a good opportunity? I'm, I'm, you know, and again, that's like I said, start with that student mind and show up as someone who's really interested in learning the who and the what and the where and the how. Okay, so we've got two minutes left, roughly. Excellent. So with that, what what final tips can you share? Uh, whether we're gaining access or well, or creating a team, maybe maybe do what kind of team? Who would we have on a team? To well, make this happen, and I'm gonna I'm gonna fold this into building the team and also re revisiting that pitching question. Mm -hmm. So figure out who are you pitching to and why. So who are you? What's your mission? Who's your audience? And folding your story into both in terms of who your mission is and and your audience is in that moment, and also longer term. Like I'm doing a comedy, so my mission obviously is it's hilarious, it's gonna make people laugh, and it's about whatever it's about. And your audience is it for women? Is it for the, the coveted 18 to 34 demographic? Is it for, um, you know, sort of what they call sort of four quadrant, uh, men, women, adults, and children? Where, you know, where is that audience? And so crafting a pitch and also making sure, like, it's a signature story, that this is the story that you were born to tell. There's nobody on the planet who's going to tell this story as good as you can. All right. So that's a lot of information. So I'm, I'm going to tell all of you. This would be a good idea to listen to this show in the in the podcast download format, um, which we will have up and available in a few hours to you. But in what Philippa Burgess has really told us is that it's work. You've got to fine tune it. You need to know exactly who your audience is because that's one of those boxes you've got to fill: man, woman, children, animated thriller, suspense, romance, horror. You got to know all those kind of things. Um, it's not for everybody, so step away from that little baby. And really, you need to understand what's going on on the social scene. I think in Hollywood, if there's, if they, they may not know what's the internal corporate mandate, but they do know what seems to be flowing. Yeah, and if you're interested in more film or television, you'll you'll lean into the events and the organizations that will mentor you and guide you in those directions. And and with that, we're going to say adieu. <laughs> we'll Thank see you. all of you next week. Next week, we're doing legal things. This is Judith Bryles. Thank you for being a part of your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles.